Hey, welcome everybody. It's time for another episode of Dr. Homebrew. But only this time we don't have any homebrew. This is Dr. Mead Brew or Mead something. Brew. I don't know. <laughs> we decided to switch it up a little bit and uh, we're going to do a whole show dedicated to Mead. Brian Cooper here, our, uh, my uh, stalwart and svelte co-host, uh, recently became a Mead judge. Brian Cooper, is that correct? Yes, I, I sure did. I took the exam on Saturday, and uh, our buddy Herendu kind of twisted my arm. I had, I had thought about doing it several times before, and I uh, uh -huh. uh, just never studied for it. I, you know, if I'm going to do it, I want to do well. I've been a judge sure. for a long time, but... But this is, I, you, this is what judges do. This is what the homebrew judge community is. They, they're they arm twisters. Yeah. It's like, oh, mm. no, come in, come mm. in. Just You could mm. just be a recognized beer judge. We need wine judges and mead judges, and you're never mm. leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. hey, you, get, you get alcoholic beverages. Come on, join uh, us. Yeah. So, uh, okay, well, that's cool. Well, so we're going to talk about that, of course, uh, because mead judging, uh, mead is, is growing in popularity. And, uh, you know, I think the mead judge community needs to be, uh, you know, supported a little bit more. We need some more mead judges as well as, like I said, every other thing that you can judge. Uh, we need more people to do it constantly. But mead and ciders, I think, are those two that we really need some attention to. So we're going to be drinking two meads here tonight. Um, both from our good friend Michael Fairbrother at Moonlight Meadery in uh, New Hampshire. Michael, welcome back for like the millionth time to this show. Oh, my pleasure <laughs> to be here. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's your pleasure because we we actually uh, bought these meads. You didn't have to ship them to us. So it's like... <laughs> Yeah, I was a little worried when I got the notice to ask to be on the show. I'm like, shit, how am I going to get this stuff there so quick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I mean, you, you don't you don't mind paying like 300 bucks for Express First Overnight for these, right? Yeah, <laughs> I've been known to do such crazy things, but yeah, <laughs> this is true. But we left you, we let you off the hook. So thanks for joining us uh, last minute. I, I appreciate it. I think it'll be great. And then uh, with, of course, uh, Brian and John. Or Brian and Brian is uh, John. And John, you took the meat course with Brian, correct? We did, unfortunately, nice. together. Okay, so it's uh, yeah. right next right. to each other. Yeah. All right. That's Which good. actually was very appropriate because the first BJCP class I took was in Brian's old apartment with him. Oh, we okay. took the whole class together to <laughs> get where we are today as uh, beer judges. That's what he told you? It was a class? It's a, it's yeah. a judge <laughs> class, man. But there's no one here, Brian. I know, but it's... Come over and drink beer. He's I did twist me. his uh, twist his arm to, to <laughs> have him join me in the in the endeavor here. Hey, and, we uh, have we had the not then Master Cicerone also in that class with us. Don't forget. For sure. Who's that? Miss Miss Nicole Ernie. Oh. In that brew, yeah, the the first judging class. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. That was Look a that. Uh, was a uh, who's who of everything. <laughs> nice. Yeah, basically, we got to get Nicole back on the show. Honestly. And do some yeah, definitely some off flavor stuff or I don't know whatever. Um, but, can tell us all about crisp lemony zip. That's right. Before we get to that, of course, we want to thank our sponsor, Five Star. You go to fivestarchemicals.com right now and learn about the best ways to clean and sanitize your home brewing equipment, with which is, of course, with using Five Star Chemicals, Star San, and PBW are the stalwarts. They have a bunch of other ones too. So I know I harp on uh, Star San and PBW because those are the ones that I really know and use constantly i mean I, I clean a lot of kitchen equipment in my house equipment it's like sounds like i have like a you know full <laughs> like full-size professional kitchen but you know i dabble in stainless things i don't know whatever um anyway it's great for cleaning all, all sorts of stuff too not just your home brewing equipment but that's really what we want to emphasize is you clean and then you sanitize you can't sanitize and clean at the same time it just doesn't really work out as well as doing both and the best people to do that with are five-star chemicals you can do that before we uh, get into the meads, of course, as I open, uh, which one did you say? The fling? Yes. Michael? All right. Before we get into that, if you want to be on the show and you don't have a successful meadery on the East Coast, you can uh, submit a beer or a cider or a mead or a wine or anything to brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. And I'm really just killing time because I'm trying to get this. Somehow I managed. So first of all, Michael, I think I've said before, God bless you for not wax dipping your bottles. I still don't know why people wax dip, but I somehow managed to still ruin the um, the the heat shrink enclosure. I, I I pulled the tab off. I'm too strong, so I'm, I'm <laughs> battling with this right now. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, so email brian at thebringnetwork.com, and we'll get you started up on the show. We'll get you on here, and, uh, you know, we'll do our, our fun stuff. So anyway. Careful, careful Michael, with those corks. Yeah, they're know, in there. Oh, they're in there. All right. Uh, all right, Michael. So, oh, geez, they are in there. Damn. I bet Michael. <laughs> the bees. Yeah, well, no they're, problem. They're in there, man. There we go. There's about uh, 3 million bottles sold so far. Each no shit. Hand oh, yeah. by Michael Fairbrother himself. <laughs> uh, not too much anymore, but uh, it used to be the case. <laughs> if you want something hand corked for me, you want my uh, Utopian, which is our 10 year barrel age in Samuel Adams uh, Utopias barrels. That's the that's the, the wow. baby. That, that gets nice. the um, the the leader's touch from starting. Yeah, to it's an embossed label. It's got a I hate to say it, wax dip top. And, oh, uh, you! <laughs> I, knew it. I knew you'd do it to me at some point. But uh, this mead we're going to try is a uh, strawberry rhubarb. It's made with uh, orange blossom and has the uh, base honey for it. Um, so it's going to be a semi sweet. It's got a nice uh, light pink hue to it. So one of the first things a mead judge wants to look at think about when they when they put a meat in a glass is the color the clarity you know it should be crystal clear you want to nose the the meat so take a sniff of the aroma here i'm getting fresh strawberries tartness clean overall impression fruity notes honey is is not as floral as as some meads can be but we, you know we're trying to go for the the harmony of the beverage so we're looking for the totality right so yeah. how does it all pull together because i want to above all i don't want people to think oh my god it's it's a honey drink i want them to think oh my god it's delicious and buy right. another one and buy another one <laughs> so yeah, it, I, I imagine it's almost you don't you, you, you don't want them you don't want them to concentrate on like the base the beverage you know treat it like a wine or just a it's a drink yeah uh, one of the things i've had in the past is Think about um, sausages, right? You don't want to necessarily think about what goes into a sausage. You want the <laughs> sausage to taste good. Right. Yeah, exactly. That, that is well, And that's why we're, we're going through with these, these meads from you, and you're kind enough to sort of lead us through sort of like a mead judging. And Brian and John, you guys can jump in at any point too and talk about how the points that Michael is mentioning – are reflective of the mead score sheet and we can just sort of talk about that but this is our hardcore mead introduction to the show because like brian was saying if we're gonna do it we're gonna half-ass it we're always talking something about like bringing that. on it's something like that or no. yeah we want we want to bring on more beverages and different things and uh, you know we always say yeah send us your mead wine sake whatever what, what have you and uh you know yeah now so of course yeah, John and I have been judges for about one one thousandth of the amount of time Michael has. You're probably one of the first ones, I would, I think, right? <laughs> I'm just clearing two hundred points now on the uh, BJCP uh, wow. score sheets. But, wow. um, is mead something that needs to open up like wine? It's not quite as um, <sighs> some yes. So mm -hmm. there's so much diversity to what can be out there. Um, this one is actually pretty young. Uh, I think we've we've bottled it in the last six months, so it's it's got a lot of depth of character. The flavor, um, the rhubarb adds a lot of crisp tartness to give the presentation of a semi sweet. Um, you get some sweetness on the edges, but you know you get that deep tartness to balance that strawberry sweetness. And what holds it all together is that orange blossom honey, which has that nice floral note to it. To um, mm -hmm kind of make it presentable like i i've had this with like a triple cream brie and it's just you know the pairing for like the creaminess of a cheese versus the tartness of this um the rhubarb and the strawberry mead um really kind of pulled together nicely okay like cut through the fat um is there a glassware concern that we should be dealing with too because i just have these like straight walled 10 ounce you know taster yeah. glasses me too yeah, you know, those work. Um, we typically recommend a smaller pour, <laughs> you know, like a three ounce <laughs> yeah, well, to four ounce pour. Yeah, uh, we I did... probably got two fingers in here, so I'm. Yeah, I'm you're doing fine. you're doing fine. But and uh, we shape have doesn't matter as much. I prefer wine style glass. Like our moonlight meter glasses have this, uh, you know, little tulip shape. Um, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a six ounce glass, but you know, if you get a four ounce pour in there, you know, the the moon submerged and. Uh, 
you know, it gives people an option to share a bottle if they so choose to. What about uh, the temperature, Michael? I, I had mine coming out of the uh, beer fridge in the garage at 40, let it kind of come up to 40, 44, but it, it, I think it needs to be warmer. Yeah, so I typically like them at room temperature. Um, but room temperature can vary depending on where you live. Uh, so here in New Hampshire, that's uh, that's probably, you know, for the most time, or solid temperature, about 55, 65 degrees. Um, mm -hmm. That way you can taste more, right? So the, the reason, you know, some of the major beer companies mandate that their beer be served ice cold is they don't want you to taste taste mm -hmm. as much, right? So, you know, what we're mm -hmm. trying to strive for is that, that again, that totality of, of the expression. Like as, as I've tasted this mead, and I'm thinking about and talking to you folks, you know, what I'm tasting in the finish is that strawberry lingering tartness, some semi-sweet notes of honey coming through, but it, it really, there's a reason the number of my meads are the, the classic styles that all meads are judged against. And, and that's because, you know, we've <laughs> spent freaking 20 some odd years, 27 years working to perfect my skills at how to make mead and how to make it so i can't even think about how to make it anymore it's just you know it's intuitive it's like breathing yeah <laughs> what style would this be what style would the fling uh strawberry rhubarb mead be so this would be a mellow mel so, okay. yeah I'm, I'm i'm using the term rhubarb as a fruit in this in this context but some mm -hmm. might think of it as more of a spice um but we typically enter it as a mellow mel category so somebody might argue this would be like a methaglin because it's like a spice vegetable. Uh, it could be open category. So or, okay, uh, yeah, experimental. Was, yeah, fruit and um, and spice. You know what I find really interesting about the aroma is that definitely I get the uh, the strawberry and the rhubarb and the honey, and with the the fruit, there's definitely I mean obviously esters esters get characterized as fruity, but in a very, in a, in, I mean this in a good way, I get almost like an old ale type of aroma off of this, not with regard to the alcohol, but something that's maybe, uh, and it's certainly not like I'm, I'm sticking my nose into a glass of old ale, but there's something that's maybe analogous to like a big, a big beer that's well fermented, maybe more in like an English style where you have kind of that fruity English fermentation uh, and, and some of the esters off of that. Uh, and I, I don't mean to uh, sound like, hey, I'm calling your meat an old ale. <laughs> no, just, no, 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 Brian, I understand what you mean. So you got to imagine, though, this this mead you're trying is 14 percent alcohol. Yeah. So, you know, th this is this is a big boy, right? This this is meant to be something you sip and savor, not chug at a party. Yeah. Exactly. But I, I'm not getting like what's what's really fascinating about that is I'm not getting, you know, in a 14% beer, you're typically going to get like, oh, man, here's a big whiff of ethanol. But this is just so smooth and so integrated. I'm not sniffing like big ethanol notes or really any ethanol notes out of this. Yeah, the key is uh, fermentation temperature control. So we ferment yeah. at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, give it a three degree window of um for shift so it can go down as low as 64 as high as 71 and um, what that gives me is the opportunity to um, really keep the yeast where it's happy and we use a mm -hmm. staggered nutrient regime um, to to achieve that so we're feeding the yeast the first three days you know the nutrients it needs for each generation and that that really gets you uh, <laughs> to a very happy place now with a mead like this one, you got a pretty low pH, right? So this is like a 3.2, I think, final pH on this. So it's got that tartness that really kind of holds it all together because you don't want your mead to be flabby, right? You don't want it to have this just rich, sweet sugar bomb that, you know, you might want to take a sip, um, but you can't really enjoy it. Right? It's, like it's this so with fun. A... I know everything he's talking about now. <laughs> yes. I know what flabby <laughs> means. Flabby <laughs> isn't just a goofy term you throw out there. It, it actually has a, a, a terminology in, in mead judging. How can we, yeah. how, how would you describe that, John, you know, on your test? How would you? So, so as, as I understood it, flabby is when you typically on a sweet mead, right? So one that has a, a, a bigger mouthfeel, it's, um, it's richer, it's a little more viscous in your mouth, and it's definitely more sweet, but it's just one note. It's just sweet, sweet, sweet. 
and that can come across as flabby. Is that roughly right, Michael? Yeah, that's correct. So in, with this one, when you taste it, you feel the sides of your tongue pucker, right? You feel it in almost like a tongue depressor you know, at the back of your tongue. So that's the acidity just playing off of that sweetness to give you that, that total presentation. Now, I don't doctor this meat at all. We, we you know, it's a, it's a pretty straight, straightforward recipe. You know, half and half rhubarb and strawberry. Um, we use concentrates because of, we don't wanna, we wanna maximize our, our potential for fermentation. And, you know, in a, you know, let's see if I can scale it back to homebrew size. Um, been a long, long time since I've done home brewing. <laughs> um, but it's it's basically for a 500 gallon batch, or let's say a thousand gallon batch, we're using 50 pounds of strawberry concentrate and 50 pounds of or of 50 gallons, sorry, 50 gallons of strawberry, 50 gallons of rhubarb, and 1,800 pounds of orange blossom honey. Wow. So you know, divide that by. A thousand multiplied by five, you get pretty much a homebrew scale system. Oh. So <laughs> no, you don't do recipe. anything to balance, like you're not adding acids or tannins at the end to get that. No. It's just, you know, the recipe's got those bits in it to make it. All yeah. Harmonious. So I, I think in flavor. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's hard to describe when I used to write software for a career and think about how to write <laughs> pro or solve problems. But I almost see that the space is three dimensional. And when I think about flavors, it's that same kind of three dimensionality of thinking about how, how do I want all these pieces to work? So when I was 16, I wanted to be a chef and um, I started working at a restaurant um, and I realized it's really hot in the kitchen. I said, I make it in a kitchen. So a big boy like me, I, I needed to, to find a new, another career. So I went into computer science and um, you know, it's just, I don't know what it is about meat and, and fermenting and the like, but I just, I love the art of fermentation, right? So, you know, whether it's beer, meat or cider, you know, and you know, my bankers are like, how the hell do you know how to do all three of these? I'm like, it's the same. <laughs> it really right. is the same. <laughs> you know, everything is so simple. It's like, how do you make mashed potatoes versus French fries? Right. It's a, it's a <laughs> you know, so you know, the world can't always see what we can see and what we can taste and how do we describe it. But what I see when people try my meads is the instant reaction and their eyes smile, right? So they, they light right up. And, and, you know, I mentioned it before, we sold 3 million bottles in the last, what is it now, 12 years? So 12 years in, and, you know, we're now building this 100 acre farmstead up in the in, uh, middle of New Hampshire, just 13 miles from our state capital. And oh, wow. um, it's um, it's a seven thousand square foot house. <laughs> I mean, it's big. This is my gift wow. shop behind me, and uh, we're putting in a wood fired brick oven pizza. So I want to kind of go like the pizza port model and 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 bring some high class fo quality food to New Hampshire, and um, and people always ask me like, how does mead pair with food? Well, like this mead right here with a strawberry goat cheese salad is killer. It yeah. it it's it's all the same kind of elements and that goat cheese and the, the the rhubarb just tie it all together oh man goat cheese would be so good with this i go, i go made it at the break Brian. i know i might go check my fridge at the break to see if i'd be go i don't think i have any goat cheese in there but if i do yeah, i'll be man. i'll be eating that after the break i've got some english class. stilts in there are you with this mm, yeah well if you guys ever make it out to new hampshire you know i've got a four bedroom colonial house here that we can we can certainly host uh, yeah, all a the pretty free decent party <laughs> nice. um all right well so that is a big help in sort of addressing the uh the score sheet michael so you know we have the general flavors that we get from the meat and we're tasting the meat also um but if we run through like the bouquet and the aroma you know um i don't know if you guys uh brian and john did the the, the checklist score sheet that's the first thing that came up i don't know no, oh, yeah, we we filled out actual written out written oh, written score sheets. Okay. So um, yeah, the, the bouquet it asks for honey expression, alcohol, esters, complexity, and other aromatics as appropriate for style. So so yeah, the alcohol through. here is so hidden. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. doesn't present in the aroma too deep. Beaks up on you. No, yeah, it really does. And I don't know if my mead was a little too cold, but now it's sitting here. It's a little cooler than room temp. It's I would guess 60 something, 65. 
and I get more of that honey expression in the um, aroma. So temperature really is a big deal when you're judging meads and, and trying to figure out if your own meat is any good. Yeah, and if you're at a competition where the meads are being served ice cold, put them in a glass, warm them up in your hand yeah. uh, to get it to that temperature where you can really appreciate it. Because, you know, walk-in coolers at some of the breweries or places that might host a, a, a tasting or um, judging event may not be able to get it to you at the right temperature. So you always have the opportunity to, to warm that glass up. You can't usually go the opposite direction where it's too warm and you're trying to f figure out a way to chill it. <laughs> yeah. If you want I to thought... cool it down, give it to my ex-wife. You know what I mean? <laughs> um... JP, what a, one of the cool things, I, I just want to jump in on this because yeah. we're talking about the honey and the aroma. Yes, sir. Um, as Brian and I were going through the study materials for, for the class, we studied, I think, 21 different varieties of honey that are in the guidelines for this. Jeez. And one of the really interesting things about honey is you'll have like basswood, apple blossom, orange blossom, blackberry blossom. And I think people, and I did this too, when I first got in the class, I'm thinking, oh, blackberry honey, right. it's going to taste like blackberry. Yep. Almost none of the honey varieties taste like their namesake plants because they're getting you know it's nectar out of the flowers on the plant which are all much more similar than the fruits of the plant so floral is a super common thing but there are some that have very interesting you know characteristics like uh brian what was that one that's got the like the uh, treacle and uh, molasses was that uh um, below or buck uh, buckwheat uh, buckwheat and then uh mm. yeah that, yeah and then you have meadow foam which can express like you know uh, marshmallow or cotton candy uh, yeah. cotton candy or vanilla yeah but for the most part they're they're just more i mean you, th you think of honey and i think of it more as a floral note than mm -hmm. a fruit note so my yeah. general rule of thumb is the lighter the color of the honey the more approachable it is to most judges that want to judge a mead um the buckwheats or the heather honeys are really really earthy so the darker the honey, the higher the mineral content of that honey, and that can add, um, like our Heather honey mead tastes more like honey than honey does. You know, it's got this <laughs> really, really honey flavor that is, you either like it or you hate it. There, okay. There's not a uh, middle ground on that one. Um, but, you know, and when I first started, you know, we had Gordon Strong come out and um, he was tasting them. He goes, oh, just leave this alone because I'm ready to dump the whole batch. He goes, give it about 10 years. Well, 10 years later, <laughs> we sell for $125 uh, uh, a bottle. <laughs> so, yes, Gordon is correct. And, uh, you know, really a spot on um, knowledge base of what goes into, you know, a particular honey. You know, I used to always swear off buckwheat honey, but now I've got a few that we've made with buckwheat where it's a percentage of the, the combination. So I'm trying to figure out how to how to take the elements of that honey and apply it like a chef might apply some habaneros or some spices to a particular dish versus, oh, I'm just going to use all buckwheat. You know, oh, it's, yeah. it can be an ingredient. Yes. Yeah. I remember the, the first, I think it was the only time I, I entered a mead, uh, to your point, John, it was a, a competition. It was a watermelon honey. And I got shit on because it didn't taste like watermelon. I'm like, you motherfuckers, uh, what is going on here in the world? But, you know, the, 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 sometimes too much information hurts you when you're entering into competitions, yeah. you right. know, and I've, I've had mislabeled bottles go to a competition back when I was entering homebrew and, you know, they're judging a raspberry meat as a blueberry meat. And I'm like, they're giving a great score. So I'm going, you got the wrong bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to that point, if you're entering a, a, a mead in a, a homebrew competition, whether do you enter the like orange blossom? Do you enter the base me uh, honey or do you, do you just say regional honey? Because you don't want confusion. Um, but maybe you're maybe that's just expecting the judge to not know anything. And that's not very cool either. Like, how do you? How do you yeah. present the, the base honey? So it depends how generic your honey is and how, like I just finished writing an article for uh, Brew Your Own Magazine about single varietal honeys and, and the complexity of the, the characteristics of those honeys. Mm -hmm. If you enter the orange blossom eat as just a generic wildflower and you get an experienced judge, they're going to 
tell them. Oh, will they, they do that? I doubt it. Um, really, the, what the judge's job should be to look for is how exemplary the quality of the fermented beverage is and how well does it taste and overall react. So, yeah, you know, like I, I, I always harp on this, but, you know, I, I don't think about what goes into sausages when I try to eat a sausage. I think about, hey, <laughs> is it any taste, good taste or not? And, and that's kind of, um, you know, been my mantra for 12 years. And it's probably why, you know, we've, we've done what we've done. It's because I think about all that, you know, what's the expression? Cut I make this stuff. I don't care that it's funny. I mean, judge, but I mean, the end consumer who buys everything I buy, whether it's at Total Wine or more or wherever they on online at our shop uh, or at one of my two locations, you know, they're, they're coming into, uh, sorry, JP, I got to throw the plugs in there. <laughs> Well, it's funny because I, I met Shard today to exchange one, uh, the meads, and I'm like, 20 bucks. Says it's, Michael's just going to be getting those sales pitches. And he goes, Well, he's a successful uh, businessman for a reason. I, go, I know. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's right. just, uh, I, I didn't well, mention good, that man. we won Best of Show uh, and uh, <laughs> Grand Champion at the San Diego International a couple of years back. But yeah, I Oh, got really? It. Do you tell. I, I did it before you, though. So, you know, it's all right. Yeah. Just kidding. I love that JP's watermelon mead was that, and, and this is the reason why Brian Cooper and I went into this is I've been invited to judge meads before, but I never felt comfortable. I want to know what the heck I'm talking about. So if somebody puts a watermelon flower mead in front of me, I don't expect to taste watermelon. Right. We've, right. we've made mead together. You know, we've, we've learned in our club how to help taught members of our club, how to make mead and, uh, I've won a couple of medals over the years, and it's it's a nice feeling when you do that. But uh, you know, it it's just uh, it's about we, sharing the knowledge. We take this people, shit seriously, man. People That's tried mean. try well, mead we, for the first uh, time. I still remember the first time I tried mead. I was up in Seattle, and somebody just had some homemade mead in their fridge. I'm like, I'll try that. Sure. Uh, you know, I was like, I think JP and I met probably close to 20 years ago, and it was at one of the brewing. Well, it's been a while, but yeah. you know, the American homebrewers conference or whatever it's yeah. now called. And, you know, the, the love of sharing a good mead and, you know, talking about that, you know, yeah. it's, um, well, it's, cool. <sighs> and it, it's, it's what binds the hobby together, you know, across, across all fermentation disciplines is just the act of like communication and, and talking about what you're experiencing. And like, you know, that watermelon mead, the, the watermelon honey, I, I still remember it. Cause it was from the uh, supplier of our orange blossom honey. When I worked at more beer, and he's like, yeah, sometimes they get like carrot flower honey and just like whatever. And there's, mm. you know, it doesn't taste like carrots, but there's, there is a flavor modification. Like the watermelon honey was lighter and brighter. Orange blossom honey to me is sort of medium flavor, dark, you know, a little bit of darker, you know, thing going on, um, you know, but I don't know as a judge, if you're expected to know that or comment on that, like if it's even, you know, what are you going to ding someone because this meat is too light, but it's orange blossom, honey, uh, you know, I don't know. Not, not often. I mean, I've judged a number of best of shows at the, the Mazer cup international and I'm flying over to Poland um, next week oh, to geez. judge at the, the wow. uh, mead madness cup. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, wow. I've, I've of judged good for me. it pretty much on every continent of the, the world at this point um and it's it's again you know how how evenly balanced and how presentable is this mead you don't want to see a hazy mead you don't want to see oh. a mead that's just screaming fusel alcohols or is so sweet you're thinking oh my god <laughs> give me a diabetic epi pen or a well, case maybe like, insulin for, shot for the you know the bouquet and the aroma again back to the this is the hard part about you know talking mead is like the social lubricant um, it really gets everyone going because, you you know, everyone has a, a story about it. Um, but just to to rip that bandaid off and bring it back to the, the score sheet just a bit, the bouquet and the aroma, you know, a, a lot of these are, are you know, very you know common things, I guess. Like, you know, are there banana esters? And that's, you know, parallel to beer. But, you know, I don't really expect need to have that. Um, but, you know... It, uh, things like complexity, the c complexity in the aroma, uh, sweetness in the aroma, acidity in the aroma, balance, all those things you take into account. And then, uh, you know, how honey, is it the, is it the honey of floral or perfumey or is it the spicy or like, these are the kinds of things that you want to be, be noting, at least according to, you know, to this mead <laughs> thing. I don't know. 
And you get some of that, like your mead right here, uh, the fling does have a brightness. It does have an acidity in the aroma. Um, sweetness a little bit. Actually, kind of a lot, obviously. Um, but it's complex. It's it's a lot. I don't know. Judging mead would be really hard for me because it is almost like sensory overload, at least with this mead. There's a lot going on. Um, and I think it would really uh, also be hard to do this, you know, five times in a row. <laughs> when you have 14%. I could barely do it with IPA. <laughs> Think about this mead, though, JP. If if he had backed that honey off and it was uh, like a, a lightly sweet mead, you would have so much acid in in this. It'd be like drinking a rare barrel. You know, Absolutely. it'd be just sharp, sharp acidic. So it's the cool thing is again going back to the class is it's all about balance of alcohol, tannins, sweetness, and and your uh, acids. And if you can do that, which this it does. Yeah, that's controlling the perception of sweetness. So yeah. this this would actually probably on the hydrometer scale show as sweet, but you know we never enter it as sweet because of that acidity, and it would it would get trashed <laughs> in a sweet mead okay. competition, like yeah. you know, like uh, the redheaded stepchild. Right. Okay. All right. Well, then what about flavor, Brian? Take us through a little bit of flavor here on this. Yeah. Um... So in the in the flavor on the on the mead score sheet, you want to look for uh, the honey varietal acidity, the tannins, alcohol balance, the body. You talk about the body in the flavor section on the score sheet, which I think is kind of funny, but it does. Uh, the body does come into play. It's it's more about a wine like you're judging, where you're you're, you're judging the structure of the whole thing um, together and that these how the different elements play off each other. So the body is another part that comes into it. You have you know really. Um, full-bodied mead and it doesn't have enough you know other structure acid and and you know everything else to stand up to it or sweetness you know if it's just really dry just I don't know it's it's going to play a lot differently so yeah I mean I get I, I do get the bright strawberry um, but right you know alongside that is a, is a nice really smooth alcohol and a really nice uh, orange blossom honey character just a little you know perfumey a little um, you know floral And um, you know, you get both of them in tandem. It's it's blending nicely. And that yeah, the, the acidity you really detect a lot more in the flavor than in the nose. Something sometimes something can smell like it's going to be tart or acidic, and it it really isn't. You know, <laughs> that acidic. But um, to this one, to me, the flavor and the aroma match pretty well. It's like what you expect is, is what you're going to get. And um, you know, there's I'd say there's not a, not a whole ton of um, tannin in this, but I'm thinking that yeah, it's the the it's nice that the all the acidity in this is coming from the the fruit, and you had to put a, a ton of fruit in there to <laughs> to make that happen. It's just uh, it you know makes me ask the question: How do you deal with all that fruit matter when you make a you know? I guess you're using uh, puree, which probably helps, but uh, concentrate or concentrates. Sorry, yeah, not puree. Um, you, you said to, fifty gallons, right? Yeah, each. so yeah, so that's a <laughs> wow. It, it equates back to 300 gallons of uh, regular juice. So we're using 600 gallons of juice in a thousand gallon batch, and there's not a lot of water or uh, anything else. So let's see, it's 275. So interesting. 150, about 150 gallons of honey, and what did I say? 600, so 750, so 250 gallons of water only in this batch. Wow. And all that tannin structure you're tasting is from the fruit. So we don't add tannins to our meads either. I wouldn't even know how it to start. There. Yeah, it is there. I mean, you know, there is a, there is a, um, a, 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 a tannin esque sort of cleansing of your palate too. Yeah. A little sure the rhubarb is, is yeah. contributing that to, you know, if it was just, I mean, we do make a strawberry mead, but you know, if it was just on its own where, you know, I wanted that punch and that bite, to come from the rhubarb. And when we made this with wildflower honey, it didn't have that liveliness that you feel like it feels so light on your palate. With uh, wildflower honey, it, it felt a little more thicker, a little more less interesting. So we only made one batch with the, uh, the wildflower and everything since then has been with orange blossom. Um, and this is the only fruit meat I make with orange blossom. Okay, interesting. I was excited when I saw the bottle because what's my favorite pie in the world? Strawberry rhubarb pie. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> oh, 
Uh, I thought you were going to talk about the graphics on the label. I was like, oh, no, 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 there. Here we go. <laughs> no, not well. Yeah. We should talk about the graphics on the <laughs> label. And yeah, we don't know if it's a guy or a girl. Huh? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> the uh, yeah. Rocky Horror Picture Show official mead. Yeah. The mead, there the you go, Jeffy. Have, uh, nice, well, nice, uh, nice legs to the mead anyway. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, oh. All right. Well, uh, on this score sheet, I'm, I'm seeing a, a form for stylistic accuracy. What do you, what do we think about that? I mean, I, I don't want to sit here and judge Michael's mead in front of him, but uh, you know, is this hit the, what is the melomel? Is that the category? So it's actually a classic commercial example of uh, M3A fruit and spice mead. So oh, well, there you go. It's listed in there under, okay, under M3A. Should be stricken from the record now? Should we call You, you could go now? either way with mm -hmm. that. Mm-hmm. It Gordon's just depends gonna on your remove definition your points of rhubarb. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. But yeah, is what is the spice? <laughs> That's the rhubarb. The rhubarb. Yeah, the spice is like a rhubarb. Yeah, so, so like yeah. I said, if if you were to go the melomel route, you might have a hard time trying to uh, convince a judge rhubarb is a melomel, as a fruit because it's actually like celery. You know, mm -hmm. it grows and looks like celery. It's just, yeah. but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a coin flip in my world. But. It's, it's the tomato <laughs> argument. Is it a fruit? Is it a vegetable? Yeah, that's a weird, <laughs> right. like we used to grow it. My mom, you know, in Minnesota would make, you know, rhubarb pies and all this stuff too. And it's, it, you know, treated it like kind of like a fruit, but it does. Yeah, I guess technically yeah. it is adding a spice element here. So, well, I think that's part of the, the roadblocks we run into as, you know, uh, home brewers. And people who are interested in the judging community, you know, lump myself into that too. That's how I do it. It's because the more you define something, the the kind of then you then you run into something like a rhubarb. We're like, well, what is it? You know, so I have to you have to play that game, the judging game of how do you enter this, and then yeah. is it appropriate to the style? Which we we do that on the beer show, on the beer side of things, all the time with with uh, guests. You know, should this be spiced herbal vegetable beer, or should this be? Uh, you know, I don't know. What, Where what do you put coffee about? or cocoa or right. things like that? Yeah, it's like, huh? Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's do this. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to open the next mead, which is the desire. And Michael will walk through that a little bit more coherently, I think, um, <laughs> through the score sheets, because we, uh, we did sort of ramble a little bit. But uh, it was all great information. And uh, the fling is still tasting good. I'll, I'll say that, Michael. Thank you. Still tasting great. Very yeah. good. So hang on, everybody. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Dr. Homebrew. Stay with us. All right. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. I'm about to pop the synthetic cork of the Desire uh, mead. Michael, what's yes. up with the Desire? Tell me a little bit about this mead and, and uh, maybe what category it would be in. Yeah. So yeah. this is clearly a melomel. It's a black currant, blueberry, and black cherry. Um, we um, This is the mead I started my company with. So way back in 2009, I won a best of show competition with this meat out of 253 entries in the competition. Wow. And um, it like continues. It's numbers, dude. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so we, uh, we've, behind our apple pie, this is our second best seller that we've always made. And uh, this is one of our flagships. So it's rated to 38 states in this country. And we have exported us in hong kong canada speaking of uh apple pie i just had a quick story because i'm wearing my my bna7 shirt i from, saw uh, that from seattle 2012 mm -hmm. and the picture in the background here is is from us hanging out at that party at uh elysian in, C in seattle and uh just there was you know we were enjoying the party uh you know uh listening to the music hanging out and and then uh i i, I don't believe i'd ever met michael before but uh this guy's wandering around with a bottle of Kurt's apple pie, but no cork, mm -hmm. corkscrew, no corkscrew to be found anywhere. And just asking, you know, a couple of people, do you happen to have a corkscrew? Like now, now uh, I remember it when you mentioned the whole corkscrew yeah. thing. And then, uh, and so the, there's something to do with car keys. And, and I like, I remember like, I think we could do something here. We could, like, just get a car key down in there and, and wedge it up a little bit. And eventually we got that, that cork out of there. And, uh, the mead was shared and there were a lot of uh happy people there was much rejoicing yeah i think uh, we actually got the cork into the bottle I, I pushed and, it in yeah yeah <laughs> it, and it worked there. yeah it worked fine it didn't hurt it it was just yeah so that a lot of good a lot of good memories at the brie and a uh 
uh, parties over the years, that's for sure. Yeah. I think my uh, Russian Imperial Braggot, um, Sour Braggot was a, uh, a crowd pleaser for, for many, many years. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hope we'll get to do one again. Yeah, I'm happy to be doing it with you guys. Absolutely. I just got a personal invite to uh, Pete Schlossberg's Sloss, uh, birthday over in Belgium coming up this uh, summer. Oh, no. Holy cow. Uh, yeah, dude, I'm, I am <laughs> I am over the moon. So uh, <laughs> Pete and I got to present at the, um, I think it was Argentinian uh, Homebrewers Conference or Belgian or some conference back. And we spent a week in a private hotel talking and beer and shop and everything and, you know, became friends and, you know, to go celebrate his 70th birthday or 72nd now is, is something on my, my bucket list and we'll make yeah. it happen. Nice. That's Thank really you. awesome. Uh, all right. Desire. So this is, you said a, a mellow mel. Yes. True mellow mel. Okay. So uh, this is sweet category. So okay. it's going to have a rich sweetness. Uh, you got a lot of complexity coming from the fruits. Um, so on the uh, clarity again, crystal clear. You know, just a bouquet of fruits coming rich right up from the sweetness is there. Not a lot of spicy alcohol notes, so no fusel alcohol. Yeah, and the sweetness in, in the aroma is is noticeably different than the um, than the fling. Yes. Yeah. It's so this much more f um, darker, sweeter aromatics. And if, if on each of our bottles, you'll see we have a little sweetness scale on the side to kind of give customers a guidance of you know, where to expect it and where to think it's going to lie. Um, so not quite dessert like sweet, but okay. it's got a lot of, lot of flavor on it. My first yeah, it whiff of aroma reminded me of just red wine, just simple until I, you know, then I took it in and I got all the rest of the complexity, but it, it just jumped at me. What holds this mead together is the current, right? So the current gives you a lot of red wine esque like components. You know, the cherry is kind of the bridge between the blueberry and the uh, the black currant. But all four or all three of the fruits really tie in to add texture and structure uh, to to this mead. So again, sweet but not overly sweet. You know, really, you know, the perception might be even a little bit drier than than where we have it indicated. But, you know, this, when I've literally seen customers taste this at a tasting I've done across the country, look at my distributor, start handing her bottles of wine out of the cart. And he's like, mm. well, what do you mean? I don't work. And I'm like, look at him, I'm going to take the bottles because the next thing they're loading this <laughs> the cart with uh, my product. I'm like, here's a lesson. If somebody offers you to take bottles out of their cart, you take them. Because <laughs> you know, that means <laughs> ours are going back in that cart. Right. Um, but yeah, we, you, we go ahead. No, no, you, you go ahead. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, I've just said we've we strive for that, that simplicity of that smile in the eyes yeah. of I bring this to homebrew conferences, uh, local beer homebrewers events for probably close to a decade. And, you know, everybody was like, oh, where can I buy this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to make a living doing this. And now I've got 10 employees. <laughs> yeah, so. well, and it's, you know, looking at the, the, the bouquet and the aroma on the score sheet, there's a, you know, the, the section for complexity, low, medium, high, I would, I would consider this high complexity yeah. aromatics. Yeah. That'd be fair. So there's, there's a lot of fruit going on, right? So there's, yeah. yeah, there's a ton more esters uh, going on in the in the aroma for sure. I love the tannins from the uh, the skins of the you know currants and these darker berries. Give it that nice little squeaky tooth tannic character to it. Yeah, I think you can the, even get a hint of that in the aroma, which is which is weird. So Kurt Stock, one of the um, homebrew con conference mead, mead makers of the year way back in the day mm -hmm. came out with this recipe and he called it his triple berry so i wanted to call it triple berry when i created it because kind of berry's not a berry you can't call, call it triple berry I'm like, what the hell really so cherries or fruits don't have uh, pits or berries don't have pits so you can't call a, a cherry meat a, a berry huh. <laughs> okay i mean well What's weird is the, the coffee bean, the fruit around a coffee bean is called the berry. So go figure that out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like We're just roasting the seed of a coffee plant and calling it coffee, but that, yeah, so whatever. 
anyway. I didn't think Kurt Stock made anything as light as 14%. Uh, his might have been closer mm. to 18, but there's, <laughs> there's taxation involved. So, you know, 14 is yeah. uh, a, a nice light number on the tax wallet. But yeah. uh, if you think about this mead and you think about the flavors, so how I try to describe this to sommeliers and such is think of it like a port, right? So the mm. complexity of a port wine you don't have to drink a lot so you can and with meads they don't oxidize quite as fast as like a red wine so you can open that bottle and share it and come back to it if you want they don't usually last beyond an hour here at my house but um mm. you know we, yeah. we've had uh opportunities to have bottles opened and recorked for months on end i think i would love this with a, just a decadent you know rich brownie and just you know like you know you've yeah. had pork and brownie pairings before that's that's so fun and this would work with it in the same way the flavors are very bold or, and or a seared duck breast with uh mm. with this would be fantastic. Right. remember we're we're mead judging guys we're not we're not preparing <laughs> shit for packs it's making me hungry jp i can't help it i know we're gonna, we're gonna go to we're gonna pivot to dr duck breast uh <laughs> and that'll be people will send us their favorite duck breast uh stuff they've prepared that'll be great yes. But no, you talk about red wine, Michael, and I really, when I, I first had a sip of this, and part of it was the color because it's so deep purple, but it really reminds me of a Syrah because <laughs> it's got it's got the dark purple color. It has the tannin, uh, which not like, a, not like a rough tannin, like a really young Syrah, but more like an, an older Syrah. It's got that kind of current flavor that a Syrah has. Uh, and it's really, I could easily pick this up and drink this instead of a Syrah. Uh, and be very pleased and very happy with my choice. But it's kind of, to me, in that, maybe in that ballpark. Yeah, so what you're, what you're picking up on is, you know, similarities, right? So what, right. what makes a wine buyer want to try my mead? So this is why, you know, we've talked to the country, don't put us in the wine aisle, put us in the beer aisle, because right. wine buyers aren't looking for mead. You know, beer buyers are more trained to think about, oh, possibly new style, something I might want to try, judge, or, you know, change my palate with. And um, there was an account in uh, Denver. They did a test with a section, the beer section and the wine section. I'm not sure exactly how they manage this, but they found out that the beer, the beer section sold 10 times more than the wine section. <laughs> no shit. That's pretty interesting. Ours is in the wine section, though, Brian. Yeah, right? yeah. Total about, wine. Oh, total yeah. wine is. Uh, <laughs> they put it next. They to are the very thing. definitive well, in where they want to place things. Yeah, it's it's, it's a dessert wine at Total Wine. Yeah, it's. I I, I, I cracked up, wine. and I I was telling my wife like this is not a wine, but here it is in the dessert wine right under the Tokais from Hungary, uh, and the Sauternes, and like well, okay, it's it is where it is, but at least I found it. Yep. Yeah, and if, if you pick up my wild, which is on the drier side, or embrace, which is the driest one we make in the dessert section, you're going to be sorely disappointed because they, yeah. they are not meant to be dessert wines. <laughs> Do you hop be, any of your meads, Michael? Yeah, I've so no, I've <laughs> never made a hop mead yet. Um, I have um, shared some emails across the country with some famous sponsors of the Brewing Network about making a a hopped mead kind of combo um but you know i like hops in my beer i, I can't quite see the hop in the mead the way i like um we just yeah. you know we've got our brewery up and running now up here and i've got my head brewmaster now and you know I'm, I'm trying to get less and less into having to make it and more and more into how to critique and coach you know so you know with mike robinson being on board as my head brewer for hidden moon brewing you know, we're, we may use honey and beer, but I told them that is not, you know, I don't want to be the, the force to, to dampen an artist's spirit. So I think of mead making like art and mm -hmm. the ingredients are so simple, but how do you, how do you achieve so much more from that simplicity? Like, you know, you could think, you know, you've got a palette to paint with on a canvas. Well, my canvas is the yeast and, and the water that we use. And then all the flavors that I add to create the flavors are, you know, real fruits or, you know, concentrate as the case may be. Sometimes we're using real fruit, but it's six pounds of fruit per gallon. So a thousand gallon batch of meat is 6,000 pounds of, uh, of blueberries. And it's a lot of biomass. The chicken or the cows or pigs are pretty happy when they get all the spent blueberries. But, <laughs> sure, uh, absolutely. 
Well, you know, I think I think uh, those maybe those brighter melony, you know, new school sort of German hops would be kind of good, like a Huel Melon or something. In sure, a nice meat, sure, but sure. I I get what you're saying. I and I I think I agree with you. I wouldn't necessarily want to be. I don't think you you want to keep the two sides separate. You don't want to be the gimmicky brewery that's attached to the meadery who uses honey and everything like that. You know what I mean? You do want to you do want the 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 brewery well, to stand on. Other it. than the braggots, which well, I mean, are, braggots, are beery yeah, to begin with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's still a, it's a it's a dangerous place to play in, right? So when we use the word braggot on a label, we're trying to educate people. Consumers don't really want to be educated, not often. Um, so the word braggot scares people away from our IPA. Um, so when we launched our IPA in 2020, um, we had total wine authorization nationwide. I couldn't sell half of what we made because my distributors, A, it was pandemic, but didn't want yet another IPA. And, you know, you, so this is why we're flipping the game, right? We're going to, we're going to make a destination brewery where people come to me to buy what they want. And, yeah. you know, I'm not going to put my beer in the market. I'm going to keep it here. And I've got, you know, 15 mile views of mountains up the Suncook Valley, um, you know, here in New Hampshire. And, you know, with a hundred acre spot, we're, we're going to build a, a pretty elaborate brewery winery space, but, you know, I want to make beer for here. I, I'm, I've done this for 12 years and I've seen distributors come and go. And I think we've worked with over 80 in the last 12 years. And wow. It's, it's, wow. It's, it's not an easy game and it the big boys yeah. don't play even. Right. So no. I teach people the best about what I make, let them try it. Right. And, you know, we can watch people come into the store and spend on average $65 per couple on mead and then become loyal fans. I was at a gas station this morning and this guy comes running over. He goes, Hey, is this your truck? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he goes, you're the owner of Moonlight Meter. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I love this stuff. I'm like, all right. Uh, uh, <laughs> right now, uh, motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> I just happened really to have awesome. some in my trunk. That you could purchase. <laughs> uh, I've been on Southwest airlines and the stewardess has come up to me and said, we got bottles of your meat in the back, taking them home to my mother. And, yeah, and I was on the phone to my insurance company, somebody recently, maybe a power company or something. And she goes, you're like a rock star. And I'm like, oh, shut up. <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> that's famous. <laughs> you know, if you're going to read my name tag to tell me who I am, you know, that, that, yeah. that's not fame. Right. Uh, well, Shar, you were saying real quick, uh, this sort of reminds you of a, of a Syrah in the color. And it's like a, yeah, a little bit uh, lighter than that, you know, like a Beaujolais. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. When you're talking about color on on a mead, you know, and you're trying to judge it. What is, what is an inappropriate color? Cause there is a checkbox for inappropriate. Zero. And I don't know. I mean, well, would you ever do that? Is that something to look out for? So if you entered a traditional mead and it was this color, that would be inappropriate. Right? <laughs> okay. All right. I see. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, having right. run mead for your die and in, in other competitions, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. It's usually a software glitch of some kind where yeah. the entrant doesn't understand what's being asked or the mm. information doesn't get yeah. to the, to the judges. And for some reason, me, that seems to be the hardest category or style of, of beverages to get content to the judges that's relevant. Uh, and I don't know why that's the case, but I've seen it, you know, time and time again. Well, there's so much you already have to provide. You know, is it is it dry? You know, is it is it medium or sweet? Is it a sack or hydromel or standard? You know, still petrol. Yeah, declare sparkling. your honey variety. Declare your fruit additions. If ingredients. it's a melomel. Yeah. And a lot of it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so it should be as a drinkable. It's, <laughs> Check it's box. The color, <laughs> it's the color that it is. Yeah. If this was presented as an apple blossom <laughs> traditional, it's not gonna not the color will be inappropriate, but it is not water white. I, See I've also drink yeah. terms. Term. I've also made me what does that mean what's water so like? so that's a color of honey so there's like seven colors I believe uh for honey and it ranges from water white to to to, to almost jet black like the um, um buckwheat honeys can be oh. and um you it's know, there's the the amber scale. White. yeah <laughs> p-f-u-n-d it is literally mm -hmm. it's fun I've got it right here fun all right <laughs> Okay, interesting. I'm always in for fun. That's right. Wait, That's right. there it is. Nice. 
I saw it. Two, four, three, seven. I was right. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, old man still remembering something. <laughs> That's right. Puffund. Um, well, it I is puffund. What do we think about, the, about this need for judging? Is it to the style? I mean, it sounds like it is. It hit, you know, it's got the berry notes in it. It's uh, it's not, uh, you know, um, inappropriate for style. It's not water white. See, I learned something too. <laughs> I think this is a high 40s. Uh, this is a high 40s meet in, in anybody's book or they're just they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> Michael, when you drink your meads, um, do you do you turn off the the judge in you or do you, uh, do you automatically it, mentally assign all your meads a score because you just it's by habit? I would do that. Well, it depends if it's the first time I'm trying them or if it's just relaxing to enjoy. So, okay. you know, when my staff bring me up a sample of a new batch that we got going, you know, I'm, I, I don't usually make test batches, right? So what I'm doing is thinking about flavors. So we make one called No Need to Argue. It's a cranberry mead named after the Cranberries album. And, um, uh, <laughs> you know, I wanted, I, wa I love cranberry, right? And I'm like, I made a 500 gallon test batch and it's again took a best of show at the san diego international and i'm like not bad <laughs> it's good it it hits the marks right so i i try to think about so working with customers over the last 12 years and seeing what customers like i've really kind of fine-tuned but homebrewers and homebrew con and being able to like i don't remember which homebrew con it was but I kind of snuck in under the covers and had bottles under my shirts and stuff and popped up at an mm. empty table. And next thing I had a line down the block and, you know, it's, it's, I really get high off of the, the reaction of my customers trying what I make. And that's why, you know, I've always thrived and, and love supporting the Bruin network is because it's the same thing. You know, I go to a BNA party and I see, so many of the army show up and know me and have heard me on your podcast and stuff over the years. I mean, I think I attribute the brewing network to me getting into Australia, me going to Chile, me going to Argentina, you know, being invited to Belgium. I mean, okay. Yeah, sure. I make a good product, but you know, I think, <laughs> you know, the brewing network has definitely been, you know, yeah. Hit you if you want. How come I'm not getting invited to Australia, <laughs> dude? Man, Where's my, yeah. Yeah. You're not making a yeah, good where's, product. Where's where's my Chilean <laughs> where's my Chilean trip, man? Yeah, make a better product, Shara. That's that's that a good it. point. Yeah. But you know, and you know, I've gotten to be fortunate enough to brew beer with Mitch Steele, Stone Brewing Company, you know, Urban Chestnut in St. Louis, a great friend of mine, Jamil Zanichev at you know, up in um, north of San Francisco. Uh, but you know, I I love I love brewing. I mean, I've always loved the concept i mean i've been judging beer and mead and cider since 1996 i mean shit my kids were five <laughs> four or five years old yeah, back then. Yeah, absolutely so my michael are all of your test batches like 500 you say 500 gallons or 500 pounds <laughs> or do you yeah. i mean you're just so used to, to like brewing at scale or do you sometimes do test batches that are like smaller like a five gallon ten gallon batch so we make batches for my lunar society that are super small scale. Like that's just for gotcha. them, really. Um, but like the uh, monkey bread and monkey business, which were two banana mm -hmm. meads that we made. No, <laughs> I just went for it. 500 yeah. gallons each. And we took a, a best to show at the battle of the burbs. And mm -hmm. um, I won that on my birthday. So I walk into oh, wow. this beer festival and I see this huge trophy. It's like four feet tall. Like, what's with the trophy? They go, oh, it's for the brewer that wins tonight. I said, well, what if it's not a brewer? And they go, that ain't mm. going to happen. And I walked mm. out with that trophy. So <laughs> it put me up against oh, a yeah. beer any day or meat or cider. And, you know, I'm a competitive person mm -hmm. and yeah. I love to, to win. And I do what I do and I have done what I've done because I care about flavor and people see that passion in me and they see, you know, there's, it's hard to, I don't know what makes, you know, certain people to the top of their game, you know, and I, I realized over the years that people consider me at that level and it's, um, 
it's really humbling. It's, it's, it's hard on my heart to think about that, <laughs> that I'm given this kind of accolades yeah. for doing maybe, something that I love. Maybe it's the yeah. triple cream brie. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> we bring in Amish cheeses for our, our tasting room. Why oh my you? God, that sounds amazing. <laughs> no are machinery there, are there, involved. We Is there are, like an Amish population in New Hampshire? Do you get them from Pennsylvania nah, or what? Pennsylvania. There you so go. they they sent me a sample block, and I, I think I've spent probably twenty thousand dollars on cheese over the last two years. And uh, yeah, but well, it turns into money because people yeah. love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, we're going to take another quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to wrap things up. But we're going to let Michael go. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, for Moonlight Meadery website is what moonlightmeadery.com, I guess. Yeah, that's right. And we have an online store, so we can ship it directly to you or. Go search your local uh, your local craft beer store. Hell yeah. Cool. All right. Everyone stay tuned. This is Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. They are right. very Thanks different. Thanks for hanging on, everybody. Hopefully you got some mead, uh, cursory mead judge information out of the show. This is the mead show with our special guest, Michael Fairbrother from Moonlight Meadery. In case you didn't know, in case you hadn't, didn't catch on to any of that, Michael likes making mead. It's really it does. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, John, you were saying about the, the, the pores of each of the meads. Yeah, I, uh, I love doing this. And I think Brian always made me do this was keep keep a little bit of all your pores of whatever you're doing, whether you're judging or, or what have you. And go back to the one you had earlier mm -hmm. and taste it again, because you're going to have a little bit different perception on what that what that was all about, because your your taste buds have warmed up to the concept of drinking something other than beer or whiskey or whatever you normally drink. Yeah. And it's yeah. so fun to go back to this uh, rhubarb one now and just get that brightness off of this rich berry uh, desire, which is, I mean, they're both fantastic, but uh, yeah, zing. I'm smelling, I'm smelling the empty glasses and it, just the, you, cause you, I'm getting more like the focused honey and you know, the, the, the one in the fling is a little bit, it's you know it's a it's a lighter smelling honey and the desire is yeah. more of a darker smelling honey and just that in and of itself it's sort of it's like everything all the other uh, fruit additions sort of go away and it's you you're sort of left with the essence of mead which is the honey and i know the the flavor impacts from you know what's in it and whatever but i get more of the honey aromatics now just off the dried mead off the glass it's very it makes sense yeah and as it warms it starts lingering in the aftertaste a little more too definitely yeah, and I think that can help you if you're judging also. You know, maybe you you rinse out a glass or whatever and have a little bit, you know, residual left over for the end. I don't know how it works, but uh, uh, you can really get all aspects of, of the product. At One of the interesting uh, things about judging at wine competitions is that they give you carrots in between to, <laughs> to kind of clear out your palate. Um, really? Yeah, it's it's really hard to judge like 300 <laughs> wines in one day, all the same style. Uh, but oh, I, I, I was I've been trained as a BJCP judge, so you know, entering into the world of me or wine judging and, and being given carrots, I'm like, my teeth are purple. <laughs> really, what difference? Uh, is here's here's 300 wines and a <laughs> and a bushel of carrots. Go go nuts. <laughs> that that sounds kind, that sounds kind of too? fun. Yeah. I thought you don't you don't swallow the wine as much as you do when beer judging. Yeah, but it's still you still get pretty intoxicated. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine. Contact toasted. And your fingernails <laughs> are orange by the end of the day, right? From the carrots. You've never seen it. The, it looks like the dawn of the dead with people at the end of the uh, show, uh, event. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, everybody, we're gonna take off. Thanks very much. If you want to get your beers on the show, email Brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. Uh, now I feel confident that we could do mead officially on the show. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, mead, cider, kombucha, whatever you want. For sure. Whatever you want to judge, we'll figure it out. Thank um, you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, all right, everybody. Uh, we'll uh, see you later. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Keep brewing.